In this video, I'm going to explain how nearly dying in Bali a few years ago while I was surfing really changed my life forever and introduced me to how amazing and how crazy it can be to date here in Asia, especially if you're looking for a relationship. And I'm also going to explain why I created the Dating in Asia show and what I hope its impact will be out there. Hey guys, I'm Chad Berenger and I created the Dating in Asia show so that I could show what it's really like to date in Asia and to look for a relationship here and try and maintain a relationship here, but also to show uh, what amazing travel adventures you can have here in Asia. The Dating in Asia show is not about me. Uh, it's really about incredible stories of thousands of other people who have chosen to date this way. Uh, I wanna tell their stories about dating relationships, love, heartbreak, uh, travel, adventure, and mostly through interviews and live call-in shows is how we're going to do this. And the focus here on this channel is going to be people that are dating here in Asia, specifically looking for a relationship. Okay, so how did I almost die back in Bali and how did that introduce me to what it's like to date here in Asia? Um, so first, a little bit of context. I was on a trip, I had planned a trip with some friends to meet in London and then tour around Europe a little bit and then we were going to run with the bulls, uh, which is probably a, a good subject for another video sometime. And uh, what happened is they went through New York City and I, I booked my flights through Asia. Through I went to Shanghai first and then I wanted to go to Bali because everybody had told me that Bali is, is basically like the poor man's Hawaii. They said it was green and lush and beautiful and the beaches are amazing and it's warm and the surfing is great and all that kind of stuff. So I planned my trip to go that way to meet my friends in, in London. And uh, Shanghai was cool, uh, but when I got to Bali, everything was off for me. It was just like I was attacked and just harassed incessantly throughout my whole time there by people that were looking for money, whether it was the taxi drivers that followed me to every corner of the airport while I was trying to use an app to, uh, to, to book my, my hotel or you know just people trying to get me to do a massage or trying to uh, get some kind of other service uh, from me so it was just non-stop and the way these people would not take no for an answer um, and just would not leave me alone and would follow me around it was just different from any other country it was also just dirty trashy the buildings were run down there's horrible traffic in most parts of bali especially down in the cities and around the beach areas and that uh, so it's hard to get anywhere, it takes forever. You can take a half a day just, just to go to another part of the island even though it's a really small island. Um, yeah, and it was more like being in a desert, not in a lush tropical jungle like Hawaii. So to me, it just I, Bali didn't do it for me. I know most people love it when they go to Bali, but I, I wasn't enjoying it. But one of the main reasons I went there was to surf a, uh, a really famous left-hand break called Uluwatu. And, uh, and I believe, if I'm remembering right, it's on the south part of the island. You can, you can Google it. And arguably, Uluwatu is, is the best left-hand, most consistent, perfect left-hand wave for, uh, for surfers in the world. It's, it's right up there in the very top if it's not the best. And uh, so I've been wanting to surf there ever since watching surf videos when I was a kid. And finally got this opportunity while I was on this trip and uh, unfortunately for me, you know, I live in Utah. I don't get to surf that often. I'm getting older, and so my my surfing shape, you know, I'm just I was not in surfing shape at all, and uh, spent most of the time just paddling around, chasing waves, and and uh, not not being able to out position all the pros. Literally, um, the people that I was competing with for every wave were were just so far above my level, and and definitely pro level in many cases, and so. I rarely caught waves, but uh, spent three and a half hours paddling around and, and chasing these waves. Oh, oh, and the the check out a YouTube video here. I'll try and link it up in the in the in the top here. Um, how you get in and out of the surf break there? There's no beach and there's no easy access. You literally have to paddle through this cave where there's rocks jutting up and the waves are coming and smashing into the rocks. Um, that's the only way to get in and out of that surf break. It's really sketchy. Uh, and again, uh, I shouldn't have probably been doing it because I just wasn't really in, in good surf shape. So after that surf session, I'm, I'm ex extremely exhausted and I'm trying to paddle back in. 
And people warned me that there was a strong rip current there that was pulling people, I think, over to the, uh, what would that be, to the west side of the island. And they said, you know, you really need to aim when you're trying to paddle in. Don't aim right directly to where, to the cave, where you want to go in. You need to aim over here to this other side. Anyway, long story short, even though I did what they said or I thought I was doing what they said, I, the current took me so far past that cave by the time I could fight, uh, fight my way in through the current that um, I, I, missed, I missed it. I, and I literally, I literally just was paddling in place uh, for a long time trying to get back in. Um, and, and by now it's getting dark, I'm tired, I'm, uh, I'm just worn out, I have no more energy left. And there were a couple people uh, near me and they, you know, I said, what can I do? And they, they said, you've got to fight this. You've got to, you know, you've got to paddle back out and around and then come all the way back and make another go at it. And I just knew I didn't have the strength for that. I didn't have enough energy to even, to even try that. And I just said, look, I'm, I'm exhausted. And by then I was like, I was panting and just out of breath. And so I said, like, what, what can I do? And they said, I said, what's over this way if I just keep drifting? Isn't there a beach I can just get out? And they said, no, not for miles. But I had no choice. There was nothing else. I, I, I literally had no energy. And, and so I let the current take me. And, uh, you know, there was really, they were right. There was no beach access. There was just cliffs. Uh, for miles as I drifted around the island of Bali just waiting and looking for a, a, a place that I could exit the ocean and get back onto the island. But it was even worse than that. It wasn't just like sheer cliffs. It was like an under, like this little mini cave in most parts of that side of the island where the waves were crashing down underneath and there would just have been no way possible to even climb up. Even if I wanted to ditch the, uh, the surfboard that I had, I just couldn't get out. And uh, there were times where the waves were forcing me up against those cliffs and I was fighting to, to stay away from being smashed into the cliffs. And there were other times where the current was sucking me out to sea. And, uh, you know, I had to fight that way to just stay close enough to the, to the coast so that I could, you know, hope to drift around some, some, at some point and find a, a way to get out on a beach. Uh, so it was really scary and I, I, I kind of accepted that that was probably it for me because I was out of energy and, and I just couldn't keep fighting like that to stay away from the cliffs and away from you know being sucked out to sea. So anyway, uh, I, I really thought that was it for me. I thought I was going to die. It was scary as, as heck and uh, kind of like the capstone on the end of a horrible trip to Bali. Finally, I had drifted enough miles around the side of this island where there was a beach, and it was already dark by then, and I was able to paddle in, and I was able to, to uh, make, it, make it back to my hotel safely, but it was, it was really scary. Um, and it wasn't even too long after that that I, I realized I had lost, or maybe the hotel staff had stolen my money belt, and I had, uh, I don't know, probably almost $1,000 in there that I lost. So that was just, you know, everything was going wrong on this trip to Bali. Uh, nothing was happening right. You know, sometimes when you go to a new place, you're just not in a flow and things aren't going well. And that's just how it was for me for Bali. So I, I had planned on staying there a lot longer and then just going straight over to London to meet my friends. But instead, um, after I think it was three days in Bali, I, I had had enough. And so I pull up Google Maps and I had always, you know, I was just kind of looking for what was close by and what could I go do and what could I see because I still had several days before I had to meet my friends in London. And uh, I saw that Thailand was nearby, or at least relatively nearby. And uh, I, you know, I noticed Phuket, and I had heard of Phuket before as a beach city. And I, I thought there was actually surfing there. I mean, there kind of is, but it's not, it's not like real surfing. Anyway, um, yeah, so I booked a flight, and I went to Phuket, and uh, that's kind of what led to this whole thing. All right, so... On my first day in Phuket, I happened to pull up uh, Tinder, and I think I also had Bumble open, and I was checking out these dating apps, and I uh, was able to, you know, it was, it was just really, really interesting to me how quickly I was able to get matches and start chatting with people that were interested in, in meeting up. And so I arranged a date, and I think the, the first date I got was on the first day that I was there in Phuket. And the uh, woman that I arranged the date with was incredibly beautiful. Uh, I think she was in her early 30s, and so I arranged to take her to dinner, and uh, and that was the first day that I was there. And I just got to tell you about this dinner date because it was so opposite from my dating experiences in the United States. Um, when we first got there, of course, you know, I picked her up. I think I even bought a rose and brought her a, a single rose just just as a nice gesture. And then, of course, I opened the doors for her, told her she looked beautiful. 
I'm gonna pay for the meal, um, obviously. And so, you know, I'm doing the traditional, you know, the traditional way of dating, right? And when we first get in there and order the food, the waiter comes out and had not even set the tray of food down on the table when uh, my date reached over and off the tray before it was even placed down on the table, she grabs the bottle of water and, and a glass and starts pouring me some water. You know, just a nice, sweet gesture. And I thought, well, that's, that was incredible. Like, I've never had anyone do anything like that on a date before. Um, in, in America, at least my experiences, are that the man is expected to be doing all of the niceties, all, the, all of the chasing, all of the, uh, you know, opening the doors and the traditional stuff, and of course to pay the bill and everything like that. And the woman just sits there and takes the compliments and uh, receives all the, all the gifts and benefits of just uh, being chased, I guess, right? That's, that's pretty much dating in the first world, at least in America, in my experience. And so um, it was just, it, it shocked me that here in Phuket, Thailand, I've got this beautiful woman who's just kind and sweet that is, uh, you know, trying to reciprocate a little bit because I'm doing all these nice things for her on this date to show her that I'm interested in getting to know her. And so why can't she do something nice for me? What's funny too is when I've told that story to women that are friends of mine or uh, even, in, even family members in uh, the United States, they just can't even hear it. Like, they they just think oh how subservient of her and how how awful you know that she feels like she has to serve you and all this kind of stuff and I thought I'm like are you kidding me I'm spending you know I don't know it was Thailand so the food's not as expensive but still I'm spending a good amount of money on a nice restaurant and I've bought her a flower and I'm you know I'm complimenting her opening the doors for her I'm putting out all the effort all the risk right and uh, and putting myself out there emotionally too and all she did was pour some water, but that just sets women in America off the edge. It was hilarious. So let's contrast that with uh, like a typical first date story for me back in the United States. So I went through this phase, and I know a lot of guys are gonna say, well, you're just an idiot for doing this, and probably I was, but uh, I went through a phase where I didn't wanna just have the regular first date experience. I wanted to do something to wow you know, if I was really into a woman and I thought, you know, let's impress her, let's really show her how special she is to me, show her that I'm like genuinely interested in, in a relationship and in, and in uh, showing her that I'm in, you know, that I care about her, that I'm, that I'm into her, you know. Um, so I had this phase where I went through where I would like, you know, I'd buy flowers or a flower and I'd pick them up, you know, the traditional way, start the whole thing very traditional and uh, take, take the woman to a nice meal like spend, you know, like a significant amount on a, on a kind of high-end meal, even though it was just a first date, I was doing this for a little while. And then uh, through my company, I had purchased a bunch of airtime inside the indoor skydiving facility in Ogden, Utah. So it's called iFly, and you've probably seen those before where it's like a tube or a tunnel, and there's air blowing up from the bottom, and you can go in there and you can skydive around, right? And uh, so talk about a cool first date, right? I mean, um, so I was doing that with, with you know, I did it probably, I mean, the guys there at the skydiving place got to know me and I, I think we just had this general understanding that they would see that I was bringing different women once in a while. And it's not, not that I didn't want to be in a relationship, but anyway, when I would have a first date, a lot of times I would end up at the uh, skydiving place. So, you know, at the end of the night, I had spent, you know, a significant amount of money. And of course, I'm being the gentleman and I'm, I'm complimenting the woman on her looks and, you know, other things and just, just being, being nice in general and trying to get to know her but spending a lot of money, putting myself out there quite a bit and risking quite a bit to just have a good first date and to show her that I'm into her, right? And I can't even tell you, I had many dates like that where the woman never once even said thank you. Like not even at the end of the night, not, not after skydiving, not after dinner, uh, not after I opened a door for her or compliment her, you know, on, on how beautiful she looks or anything like that. Not even a thank you. Like that was common for my dates there in the United States. So uh, I think it's just, it's, it, that really is, it, that underscores how entitled women are and how, how radically different the dating marketplace is in the United States for men these days uh, because of how things have changed over the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years. And we'll get into that. All right, so again, for contrast, let's go back to my second date while I was in Thailand. So I'm in Thailand, and I think it was the next day I had a, a, a first, it was another first date. It was my, uh, my second date while I was in Thailand, but it was another first date. And 
This time, the girl was a little bit uncomfortable. She had never dated a foreigner before, a Westerner. And so she asked me uh, when we had connected on, I think it was Bumble on this one, she said, can I bring some friends to meet you? And I said, sure, that's fine. We'll get some ice cream or something like that. And so we met, uh, it was like in a park and, and we're having ice cream and she shows up with two friends and I didn't even recognize the girl from, because she looks so different from her pictures. It was one of those, right? And we all have had those experiences, anyone who's used online dating. But this one was, was pretty extreme. Like I didn't even know which of the three girls was the one from the pictures uh, on the dating app where we had connected, right? That's how different she looked. And so, um, and, and you know, usually it's, when it's like that, they don't look better than their pictures. They look, they look worse. They're 30 pounds heavier or 10 years older uh, than, than what their pictures actually showed. And you know, that's a bit of a catfish, right? So, uh, but I'm still the gentleman, right? I still buy ice cream and we're trying to talk and, and it, it just ended up that, she didn't speak nearly as good uh, English as her friend did, one of her friends, and it was actually the, the cute friend, like the, the super cute friend, uh, was having to do all the translating, right? And long story short, and I don't think you could ever, ever get away with this in the United States, but in Thailand, in, in Asia, in many parts of Asia, women are just more matter of fact about things. They're less easily offended. Um, they kind of just know. I mean, you'll see on all, a lot of the dating apps, any any woman who's just, even with an average figure, a lot of them will put in their dating app or in their profile, they'll say, oh, chubby girl here or something like that. Um, and it reminds me how people in Spain were really matter of fact about introducing their kids saying, oh, this is the this is our smart daughter. This is our fat daughter over here. You know, and just, just being straight up about like really matter of fact things like that. Well, Asia is a lot more straightforward and uh, people take offense a lot less uh, easily. So I went for the switcheroo and because uh, and, I just had this good chemistry going with the cute friend that could speak good English. And again, like I was somewhat catfished, right? By, uh, by the girl that I'd connected with on the dating app. So uh, without, you know, I, I guess I risked a little bit of a chance offending, but uh, I said, you know, hey, could, could we spend more time and, and you know, they kind of had to guess at what I was, at what I was getting at, but they didn't get offended. And, and you, you know, back in the United States, no girl would risk her relationship with her, with her BFF by uh, jumping in place of her friend and then taking, taking the date away from her friend, right? But it just kind of naturally went that way with us. And I was able to then have a date with the, with the, the cute girl that actually spoke good English. So again, I, I tell that not, not to toot my own horn, but just because it highlights how different the attitudes of women in, in, uh, in this case, this was in Thailand, are uh, compared to, um, you know, the first world countries that, uh, th that we all are familiar with. So. All right, so once I had had, you know, a few days there in Phuket, Thailand, and uh, a few dates, and had used the dating apps for a little while there and just kind of seen what it was like uh, to use those dating apps, uh, I realized very quickly that my, my value in the dating marketplace there in Thailand was completely different from what it was back in the United States. Um, I was actively dating in the United States and uh, I, I feel like I did okay there, but nothing, nothing like what I realized uh, things were like for me there in Thailand. And uh, so, you know, that, that's hard to go back from. It's hard to come back from that. Um, and that, I really haven't looked back since. I've, I've spent a lot of time since then, uh, these last five years, dating in Thailand, Vietnam, um, Japan, China, uh, the Philippines, Indonesia. During that time, I've, I've met many incredible women, uh, really, really amazing, uh, accomplished women and I've had a couple of good relationships, one of them that I thought really was gonna go all the way. And for a while there, for about a year and three months, we were dating very seriously, exclusively. And again, I thought, I kinda of thought she was the one for quite a while there. So um, I do think this type of thing can work and lead to uh, healthy, long-term committed relationships. And that's what I'm looking for. And I know a lot of guys that are from uh, first world countries or Western men as they call them here, they're looking for the same thing. They come here not just for casual dating, not just to party and have fun, but to find a serious relationship because they just 
find that they can do better uh, here and find women who are they're more attracted to and who have more to offer that the men value um, than what they can back in their home countries. So uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that there is a whole new global dating economy that is evolving right now um, due to a bunch of big trends. And that's because dating really is a marketplace just like any other marketplace. And all of the market forces that are at play in the stock market or in any buyers and sellers market like eBay or something like that, you know, supply and demand and all these kinds of forces um, are, are, are also at play in the dating marketplace, right? Uh, so it shouldn't surprise anybody that uh, with the globalization and other trends that are happening, that dating marketplace is expanding and, and radically transforming. Uh, so what are, what are a lot of these trends? What, what are the trends that are leading a lot of men in first world countries to find out that they can do better uh, dating and looking for a relationship and trying to find love and soulmate in Asia? Well, one of the big trends that's changing the dating landscape is technology in general, right? So technology is connecting us across the world. It's not hard anymore to pull up a dating app, change your location and start uh, matching with and messaging and connecting with and, and building rapport with people on the other side of the world, right? So that's changing everything. Another thing, uh, and I'm gonna get tons of hate mail for this and I don't really care, but feminism in first world countries, um, kind of the modern wave of feminism is what I'm really talking about. Not equality. I don't think anyone, uh, you know, reasonable can argue with equality and especially equality of opportunity and equal pay for equal work. All that kind of stuff obviously makes sense. I'm all for it. I'm talking about kind of the modern wave of feminism that really is pushing women to, in my opinion, behave more like men. Um, they just are taking on more and more masculine personality traits and things like that. And uh, those things just don't, they're not attractive to men uh, like, like femininity is. And that's just, you know, that's just genetics. That's, that's uh, in our DNA. Uh, another thing is the weight gain in the United States and other first world countries, which has been really an epidemic over the last 30, 40 years. And it's men and women, right? But I don't date men. So um, as, as I'm attracted, like a lot of men are, to fit women, it's just really, really become increasingly hard to find that. That's become more and more and more rare in first world countries. So uh, that, that has changed the dating marketplace there. And then another thing is social media and dating apps. Uh, they've really changed and I think have driven a wedge between men and women being able to kind of find people that are on their same level. And here's what I mean by that. So the problem with women posting a bunch of photos on Instagram or Facebook and then having hundreds or even thousands of guys liking those photos and, and starting commenting on them and things like that, or the same thing happens in a dating apps like, like, like Tinder, Match, eHarmony, it can be any dating app. When women get a ton of attention in those dating apps, right, they don't, I'm sure most women don't go through the, the you know, the mental exercise to, to really think through, okay, tons and tons and tons of these guys that are liking me, messaging me, matching with me, just want to sleep with me. They just want to have fun with me. They're not serious about me. And I think women don't realize that for one main reason. I don't think women realize how far down men will date uh, like on a scale from one to 10, and I'm not just talking about looks, I'm talking about the entire package, but how far down on that scale um, most men will go to just have a casual date and, and to, to just look for sex. It's just the facts, ladies, this is how men are. Um, if a guy is six foot three and 35 years old and super attractive, confident, has a fantastic job, you know, has the respect of other men and some status in this world. Maybe he's a doctor or something like that. I mean, that guy, especially if he's attractive, so he's at least an eight, right? Let's put him at at least an eight. Um, guys like that, for the most part, if they are just willing, if say they're in a phase of life where they just want to have fun, they're just they're not looking for a relationship, they'll date women who are a six or maybe even a five if that's what it takes to be able to have a you know a, a quick uh, a quick date with somebody just for fun and women don't realize this so they they open the dating apps daily or whatever and what do they see 
tons of matches. They're inundated with matches. And this is pretty much every woman that has ever used a dating app if they can get one decent picture in that dating app. So just if they take enough pictures from the right angles and things like that, almost every woman is going to be able to get one really nice picture into a dating app. And that's all it takes. And I know this because I was going to build a dating app with some friends um, as, as a startup, as a business. And so as part of our market research, we sat with tons of women and men and we watched them use current dating apps like eHarmony and Tinder and Bumble and things like that. We, we just said, let us observe you. You just go about your normal way of using this app and we're just gonna, we're gonna watch and we're gonna learn. And every time there was a woman that, that had a decent picture in her profile, if she hadn't used Tinder or Bumble or something like that for multiple days and pulled it up in front of us and started swiping, usually left, 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 no, 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 no. Every time, almost every single time she swiped right to, to try and match with the man, it was a match because those apps are gonna queue up first all of the people who swiped right on her. So, um, so what happens again, women don't think through, well, tons of these guys just wanna sleep with me and wouldn't consider me for a relationship. You know, they've, it's, it's like that hot crazy matrix, if you've ever seen that YouTube video, uh, which is hilarious, but there are so many, it's funny because a lot of it's true, right? Um, and what that, what that video really uh, gets right is that men, in terms of the initial screening that men do for women, which is about physical attraction, um, sorry to break your bubble there, but that's true, right? I mean, any guy who's looking for something serious knows that the personality, the character of a woman, her femininity and other things like that are a lot more important to who she is, what, what, what she brings to the table in terms of a long-term relationship uh, potential. But no one knows those things at a party or on a dating app. You just see pictures and you see if you're attracted enough to decide that you want to invest time enough to start chatting and getting to know somebody. So what that hot crazy matrix video on YouTube gets right is the fact that men are going to categorize women instantly on their looks in three different categories. The first category is just undateable, somebody, you know, just people I would not consider dating. And the second category is, which is a fairly large category for men, these are women that they would date casually, that they are interested in just dating for fun, to have somebody to go to the movies with, to, um, you know, have some companionship, or if they're just looking for sex, to, to just have sex with. That's the unfortunate reality and that's, that's just how it is. That's how men are wired, right? And then there's a lot smaller um, percentage of, of women that, that a man is gonna look at and instantly put into the category in his mind of, okay, I'm attracted enough to this woman to, be, to consider her for a long-term relationship. If, if we connect and start having good chemistry and if all the other things like personality and all those things are there, then she's somebody I would consider uh, you know, uh, being in a relationship with. Um, and what's funny is that hot crazy matrix pretty much gets it right in the reverse also when it talks about how women classify and categorize men um, it's it's not typically women don't place as much on, on the whole of course some women are different there's going to be outliers and exceptions but those exceptions don't break the rule the general rule is that women are going to classify men uh, in different ways and, and uh, for the most part the women will have their fun zone as that video talks about uh, when, when the guy is hot enough, but unless he earns a certain amount of money or brings a certain amount of status or yeah power um, in what he does in life and his kind of his social status and position in life and, and his earning capacity, a woman will not consider him uh, as someone she would date seriously for a long-term relationship. To get back to these, uh, how these forces are changing and, and really uh, destroying the dating marketplace in most first world countries, what happens then is you've got tons of women on these dating sites who are getting so much attention that they're like, wow, I'm like a nine or a 10. Everybody wants me. Everybody is interested in me. Everybody wants to have a relationship with me. And in reality, what it really is, is that the vast majority of people giving her attention just want to get in her pants. And so, um, that's, that's just the reality of it, ladies, that's how it is. Most guys uh, will date way down like that. So the vast majority of attention you're getting from guys are not guys who are interested in having a relationship with you. But what happens then is women think, okay, I will only date nines and tens, guys who are nines and tens in my book, because I must be a nine or a 10 because I'm getting all this attention. 
And so that creates this huge disconnect, and I think that's a big part of the reason why more and more and more people are single and not finding a match with somebody that is, you know, pretty much closer to their equal in terms of what they each bring to the table in, in, in value in the dating marketplace, in the relationship marketplace. Another huge factor in changing and really destroying the dating marketplace in first world countries is the divorce laws and how they can make it legal for a man to just get financially raped, to just get absolutely demolished uh, if the marriage doesn't work out. Um, can lose a lot more than half of everything he has. And uh, so that type of risk is causing a lot of men to opt out, right? Um, and then just the general globalization of, of uh, you know, of culture and language. So there's not nearly as large of a cultural barrier between countries in Asia and the United States. Now there's still obviously differences in culture. There's, they still have their own cultures and things, but they're much more aware and accepting of the, those cultural differences because they've been watching, you know, uh, Hollywood media for a long time. And so that cultural gap is closing. The language gaps have been closing very fast. Um, most women in a lot of these countries speak some English and many of them speak actually pretty good English. So uh, that, that's making it more and more and more possible to expand this dating marketplace and to globalize the dating marketplace. So what, what does all that mean? Well, if you are no longer limited to only dating women, I mean, if you go back, you know, 100, 200 years, you just, you, you kind of grew up and you knew a few people in your little village or town and you, you found somebody that was near your age that also wanted to have a family and if you had good feelings for each other and hopefully there was some good attraction there, that was it. You settle down and you go have a family. And uh, it, it's, you know, you, you can see a trend over the last several hundred years of our, the dating opportunities in the marketplace, uh, the size of the marketplace, the scope of the marketplace that people are willing to consider when they're looking for a relationship has grown in, in size geographically um, exponentially over the last several decades. So nowadays with all these changes, the dating marketplace really is as big as you want it to be. And you can consider dating people in other countries anywhere in the world. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that just like in any other uh, market economy, that when you take something that is common, like a six foot tall man who makes six figures in the United States, I mean, maybe it's not super common, but it's, it's fairly common there these days, and you bring him to a place where he is rare, like Thailand or the Philippines or Vietnam or China, um, and where he brings a lot more value in their eyes and in their estimation uh, in the dating marketplace and in, in the types of uh, value that he would bring to a relationship. So you bring something that's common to where it's rare, but you also, if you're a man in the Western, you know, Western countries, and if you're attracted to fit, beautiful, you know, feminine women, that's harder and harder and harder to find in first world countries, but it's completely commonplace here in Asia. I like to use an analogy to kind of explain this whole dating marketplace thing. So, because it, 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 it feels to most people like, dang, like this would be crazy. Who would be crazy enough to, you know, fly halfway around the world, spend thousands of dollars to try and find a relationship with somebody and build a relationship with somebody in another country? That just seems insane with the cultural barriers and the and the distance and the cost of, of travel and all those kinds of things. Uh, many people think it's insane, but this is an analogy I like to use to try and help people see why it's not that crazy really. If I was to, to bring a hundred men into a room and if I said to these men, hey guys, there is a, a nightclub where you can meet women and it's not too far from here, but it does take some time to get to. And in this nightclub, if you are generally a six, you're gonna instantly, when you walk into this nightclub, you're gonna be an eight. And there are gonna be more women who are sevens, eights, nines, and tens in this nightclub than you've ever seen before. And they won't think they're that special because they're, they're, the nightclub is absolutely full of them. And because they don't think they're that special, they're gonna be sweet and kind and feminine and uh, cooperative 
in looking for and reciprocal in, in the way that they approach relationships and the way that they uh, feel about men. Um, and if I said to these men, yet you have to, the nightclub takes a day and a half to get to. You gotta travel, you gotta get in a car and you gotta travel for 25 hours to get to this nightclub. Would you go? Well, absolutely. Every man in that room, most men, if they're single and they've spent a lot of time dating in the United States or in other first world countries, would in a heartbeat say that they would get in the car and drive 25, 27 hours to get to, get to that club, right? Well, it's the same thing, but you're getting on a plane instead. So we talked about uh, my market research when, when I was watching women use dating apps in the United States. And one thing I forgot to tell you about that, it was, it was interesting to me, as I was trying to explain what it's like to friends of mine back in the United States who are single guys, and I try to explain like what it's like to date in Asia when you're, when you're using dating apps. I said, well, have you ever seen a woman use a dating app? Do you see how many matches she gets, how many messages? Have you had women talk to you about how, that, how dating apps are for them? How inundated they get with matches and messages and just overwhelmed to the point where most of them, a lot of them just give up and they just say, I can't respond to all these people. I just have too many, too many people showing interest in me. And most of my guy friends will say, yeah, yeah, I've seen that with women. It's so, so one-sided, that's not fair. And I'm like, yeah, well, if you go to Asia, you will know what it's like to be the hot chick. <laughs> um, so it's a little tongue in cheek, of course, but really it's flattering to all of a sudden have the, the, you know, flip the script and to have the roles reversed and to be receiving super likes and to have women message you first and to be genuinely interested in you when they look as beautiful as they do and many of them are, like I say, sweet and kind and down to earth and, and things like that. And educated and, uh, you know, well-traveled some of them and all these kinds of things. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's nice for a change to have things flipped. So we've talked a lot about physical attraction and looks. And of course, uh, to me, I talk about that because that's the first screeners. That's the first thing we see if we're at a party or on a dating app or we're at a dance place or something like that and we want to approach somebody. We're not, you know, especially men, we're not closing our eyes and walking around, not looking at anybody, listening for someone with a good personality to decide who, who we're going to spend our time talking to and trying to get to know at that party, right? We're going to look around the room and we're going to see who we're attracted to and who we, we have that physical uh, attraction to and then we're going to approach them and we're going to try and talk to them and, and hope that they have the, the deeper you know, character and personality things that we're looking for. So aside from looks, what are those deeper things that are more important than the way a person looks? and that, that play a much bigger role in terms of finding compatibility and building relationships that can last. And I think it really comes down to three main things. Uh, first of all is personality, right? So is, is she chill? Is she sweet? Is she kind? Um, is she fun? Is she adventurous? You know, is she easygoing? Um, that kind of thing. And then uh, character, right? So is someone loyal? Are they honest? Do they have integrity, right? Are they hardworking um, or are they lazy, you know? Um, how do they treat strangers or people that really can't help them? Like that's a big one for me. I try and watch how a woman treats someone who's serving the food or something like that. Um, are, they, are they kind in general to people? Um, and then finally, it's femininity, right? And these are things that, that all men are just hardwired to be attracted to and to value in terms of who they want to date and settle down with. So when I say femininity, I'm talking about is the woman just by nature demure, um, modest, sweet, um, kind, um, maybe even a little soft-spoken. Even if they're opinionated, are they respectful? Okay, and also for many men, they're looking for a woman to uh, to have children with, right? So. What type of a mother is this, is this woman going to make and does she, can she cook and clean? I mean, a lot of guys are still looking for that traditional type of a, of a role in the home and they, the man, uh, they see themselves as the provider, the protector, and they're looking for a woman that wants to have kids with them and that is interested in being a full-time mom and staying home and cooking and cleaning. So if that's what, if that's what a guy's looking for, then that would be part of the definition of, of femininity that, that they're attracted to. So another thing that drives a lot of guys to date here in Asia and to seek long-term relationships here 
is just the general attitude that is so common with women who are, uh, if they're a seven or higher, and, and I am talking about looks here because that's the, those are the women who are gonna first get the attention of guys. So if a woman is a seven, eight, nine, or a 10, she's going to have a ton of attention. If she's fit and attractive, she's gonna have a ton of guys always interested in her, whether it's in person or on dating apps, right? And a lot of these women, especially if they're eights, nines, and tens, have been treated so differently and spoiled so much throughout their lives because of their, their physical beauty that they've just become entitled, spoiled, lazy, arrogant, domineering. Um, and guys who are listening to this right now who have dated a lot of really beautiful women, you know what I'm saying is true. Uh, it just tends to be how women are that, are that look like that. And it's rare when they don't. It's wonderful when they're not like that, but it's rare. In Asia, to contrast this, in Asia, being thin and feminine and pretty and having long hair, near, nearly flawless skin, um, being sweet-natured, all that stuff, it's, it's super common. That's just, that doesn't make them feel like they're something special or rare because it's everywhere. When you're walking around in any large city, Bangkok, um, Cebu, Philippines, or Manila in the Philippines, or um, Ho Chi Minh City in, in Vietnam, or Hanoi, or any of these types of large, large cities. When you're walking around and you just look around, and I'll get a lot of this footage for you so you, so you can see for yourself, women who are petite and fit and beautiful and, and long hair and just demure and feminine like that are everywhere. So they don't think they're special. It doesn't go to their head. It doesn't spoil them and ruin them. Uh, like it really has already done to most women who look like that in the United States and other first world countries. All right, so I'm gonna make a video in the future about this same topic. Uh, and really, I think it's gonna be titled something like the, the eight things that men are evolutionarily wired, hardwired to be ridiculously attracted to. This is too long of a title already, but the eight things that men are hardwired to be attracted to that Asian women have naturally and in spades and well into their, their old age, that women in first world countries spend on average $3,756 a year to fake. And so what are those eight beauty uh, elements that, that Asian women have naturally that, that uh, Western women are spending almost $4,000 a year to, to fake these things? Uh, we'll do a video on that. So another reason that I created this channel is to dispel a lot of the misconceptions that exist about dating in Asia and a lot of these came from the uh, the really popular uh, cable TV show 90 Day Fiance right um, that show showed a lot of women who didn't really care about the men who were using them to better their lives um, you know for either money or or citizenship in in the man's home country or things like that but I think it's given such a bad name to this uh, this whole idea of dating overseas and uh, for the most part the women that I've dated, that I've met, and that friends of mine and others that I've talked to have met and dated here uh, throughout Asia, for the most part, that's not how they are. And that's not what they're looking for, and that's not why they prefer to date Western men in many cases instead of men in their own countries. And then another big part of the you know, source of the misconceptions is that uh, you've got a lot, of, a lot of these videos online on YouTube and whatnot uh, with kind of young party guys that, that take cameras into Southeast Asia countries and film a lot of the kind of the worst areas. And, you know, these, these guys are just, they call them, they even have a name for it, sex pats instead of expats or uh, sex tourism, guys who just travel just for sex to, to Southeast Asia. And, and again, I think these are a few, relatively speaking by the numbers, I think these are, these are a few bad actors that are giving a bad name to the whole idea of, of dating here in Asia. And so I want to dispel a lot of those myths. I want to show that the vast majority of men from Western countries that come here are not like that and indeed are looking for a serious, committed, long-term, healthy relationship. And that most of the women who want to date foreign men uh, that are here in Asia, most of these women do not do it specifically for money or to move out of their home country. Um, we'll talk a, a lot about that in this series. Okay, so I have a ton of excellent guest interviews lined up here for the next few weeks while I'm here in Bangkok. And some of those interviews will be conducted 
uh, by Zoom because some of the interviewees are living in other countries like Vietnam and the Philippines and uh, China. But uh, you'll see those interviews getting posted soon here. And it's really through those interviews and eventually we'll do some live call-in shows where we can talk about these issues. But that's the way I want to help um, tell these stories uh, of thousands of people who are dating in this way. And in many cases, people who've already coupled up, found love, and in, in some cases had, had families together and have children together. I met a guy the other day in, um, in a camera shop and he married a, a woman here in Thailand and their cute little three-year-old daughter was with them and uh, she was just such a cute little girl and I asked him about it. He, he's from France and just, you know, it's, it's fantastic. He's found love here and he now lives here. Um, and so those are the kinds of stories that we want to tell. But we're also going to tell the straight truth. We're going to give you the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there is a lot of drama and crazy, crazy stories that happen, that have happened to me and that have happened to friends of mine that have dated here. And uh, so we're not only going to, we're not going to whitewash it. We're not going to just tell the good side. We're going to tell the heartbreaking stories, the wild and crazy, you know, things that can happen um, when you take the risk and, and are brave enough to kind of buck the, the convention and come all the way over here and, and uh, seek a relationship here in Asia. In the end, I think you're going to be shocked and amazed and, and really convinced that if you're a guy in the Western world, you've got a lot better dating opportunities and relationship opportunities in many cases here in, uh, in Asia and specifically in Southeast Asia. Um, but before you go ahead and subscribe to my channel or book a flight to, uh, to Asia to begin dating over here, I really want to give you a warning. And I know you'll think it's gimmicky, but I'm actually serious because uh, if you listen to these stories and you watch our episodes and you watch these interviews that I'm going to be doing with, with uh, men and women uh, telling these stories, um, it is going to change your perception about this, right? You will want to date here uh, after watching these stories and listening to these stories. Um, and if you do come here and you date here, I guarantee you, you will date two or three points higher on the scale from one to ten from what you can date in your country. And that, you know, is nice and it's appealing and it's addicting and it's hard to come back from that. You will get super likes from women and they won't afterwards apologize and tell you it was an accident that they didn't mean to send it. Uh, or, and they won't be a scammer. I mean, there's scammers here and there's scammers on, on all dating apps, right? But you'll get genuine super likes that won't be from a scammer and that won't be from somebody that says, oh, that was an accident. I didn't mean to send you a super like. You'll date women that will be sweet and kind and demure and chill and, you know, reciprocal and cooperative and uh, down to earth um, that won't be arrogant and stuck up and, and full of themselves despite the fact that they're crazy beautiful. And these women will be straightforward. They won't play a lot of the games that women in Western countries play. Um, it kind of reminds me that, I don't know, there's a country song, She Don't Know She's Beautiful, or there's also the One Direction song, uh, that's what makes you beautiful uh, and it's real it's right like people women are more attractive when they aren't so full of themselves and don't even really know that they're just crazy gorgeous right uh, there's something about that that, that makes us uh, even find them more attractive and so if you date here you will have those experiences and you'll also have crazy cool travel adventures and you'll get addicted to it you'll get addicted to dating in Asia and you know one other warning you'll have women in your country and a bunch of beta men in your country that are going to give you shit about it, right? Um, because it, it, uh, if you tell them your experiences and you tell them what you're doing, it's going to hit on their insecurities and it's going to bring a lot of things up that, that make them feel uncomfortable and people are going to try and pull you down because of it and they're going to give you a bunch of shit and say, oh, it's because you can't date here and all this kind of bullshit. Um, but really, all that does is tell you about them. It says nothing about you. So, um, but in the end, yeah, it's going to make dating, this is the warning, it's going to make dating back in your country harder because after dating here for a while, you will raise your bar significantly in terms of realizing the value you bring into a potential long-term relationship as well as realizing the type of woman and the value that, that she brings that you, can, that you can date and have a relationship with here in Asia. And once you realize that your value here is higher and that the type of woman you're looking for is common here 
it just is going to make things. It's going to make it harder for you to feel motivated to go through all the shit tests and all the chasing and all the, you know, millions of rejections that you're going to get on the dating apps over there or whatever. Um, it's just at some point, it's almost like you want to throw up your hands and just say, "Fuck it, uh, it's not working." Uh, and why, why, why bother with that when I know that after a, you know, 27-hour car ride or obviously the you know the plane ride and getting over here. I can be, I can just be dating in a completely different marketplace where I'm valued and where the type of women that I value the most are in abundance and want to date me. Like it, it's kind of a no brainer. So I'm giving you that warning because it, it will change things for you and it can make things harder uh, to date back in your own country. All right, so you've been warned, um, but so what, right? So what that it's gonna make things harder there and so what that uh, it takes a little bit of effort and planning and cost and risk to come over here and date women here and, and seek relationships here in Asia uh, because you're gonna have epic epic times meeting people here and dating here and building relationships here and, and going on all sorts of travel adventures that are absolutely incredible here and you know that's what life's about you got to make sure and make time now to do epic shit. This was a friend of mine that used to say this. Do epic shit, right? Find time and make time in your life to do things that are just epic and amazing. And what could be more amazing than, than uh, finding love or a soulmate uh, with somebody who you're just wildly attracted to, who is more cooperative and sweet and, um, you know, just more of the way that you're looking for. We, in general, I think as men in first world countries, and certainly me as a former Mormon for 47 and a half years, we've given too many fucks for all the wrong reasons throughout our lives. We have worried ourselves, in many cases, over all the wrong things and cared way too much about what people think, all the wrong people, really, cared way too much about what all the wrong people think for way too long. And life is just too short for that. And uh, so stop, stop caring. Stop letting other people dictate those things for you and, uh, and do some epic shit, make it happen. Come here and experience what I'm talking about. And yeah, the haters are gonna hate, not only you, but they're gonna hate me for creating this channel. They're gonna hate me for saying all the things that I'm saying and for telling the truth about all this stuff. But this channel is not about me. It's not about my past or my history. This channel is really about the thousands of stories that exist out there of other people who have dated in this way. And again, we're going to tell the women's side of those stories too. We want to help women in all these other countries understand what it's like for their fellow sisters in those countries who have dated Western men so they can avoid the pitfalls or they can you know, find their way through and navigate through that, uh, that maze um, with more success. Uh, so we want to tell those stories of people especially who have found success, who have found love, who feel like they've found their soulmate over here dating in Asia. Um, I want to give voice to those stories and I want to show the positive side of this unique dating marketplace uh, and, and really the positive side of the, of, of the whole trend of dating in general becoming a global marketplace. Um, and at the same time, the Dating in Asia show was built to entertain people. So I hope you have fun along the way and we're certainly going to have a lot of laughs along the way and tell crazy stories and show a lot of crazy, crazy videos of, uh, of dates and travel adventures here of myself and friends of mine and, and the people that we interview. In the end, the final and, and the most important, I hope, reason for creating this channel is to help people find loving, healthy relationships. Like, what could be more fulfilling than that. Like I think it would be absolutely amazing if together we can build a cool community, support each other, work through a lot of the issues because there are challenges. I mean it's not easy going back and forth. It's not easy relocating for, for many of the men who decide to just stay living here or retire here. Like there's a lot that you give up, right? So there's pros and cons and we're going to talk through all that stuff. But wouldn't that be amazing to create a cool community here where people that have an interest in this from both sides of the, of the dating equation, the men and the women, can get together and work through these issues, talk about these things openly, and bring out the positive sides of these things, hear about other people's success stories, finding their soulmate and finding love and building families, you know, and then 
if I can benefit a bunch of people through that and help them break out of their current, you know, dating jail that they might feel like they're in back in the United States or Canada or, or England or Australia or wherever, and, uh, and, and, you know, take that risk, get on a freaking plane, pull up some dating apps before you come, and then be ready to hit the ground running when you're here and see what it's really like for yourself. If I can help a bunch of people find love in this way, what a cool thing, right? Like that will be an absolute blast for me. And uh, I think you'll have fun hearing those stories and watching it all play out. So that's why I created the, the channel. And uh, that's what we're all about here. So that's it for now, guys. Uh, I really want to hear your thoughts. So please write some comments below. I want to know what people think about this. Um, and if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead now and hammer the, the like button and the subscribe button below. And so you'll catch the next videos of these interviews. I've got a lot of good ones lined up. I met a guy in a cafe the other day and he's ready to do an interview. His name is Nick. The guy is absolutely ripped. He's from Australia. He's in his probably late 20s or early 30s. Super good looking guy. I mean, the guy looks like a model, right? And he's completely ripped and was with this beautiful Thai girl. And I don't know if I can get her yet for an interview, but Nick is going to do an interview. So you're going to see younger guys. You're going to see older guys. Um, you know, you're, you're going to see some great people here that, uh, in the next few weeks. So subscribe so you'll see those videos when they come out soon. And yeah, that's it. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in Asia soon. Uh, till the next episode, I'm Chad Berenger, and this is The Dating in Asia Show.